Please stand as we begin worshiping God. I approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring. But the promise of accepting, that's his promise, from a good and gracious I will give to you my evidence. Yes, you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit. As I sing to you this prayer, you deserve the greater glory.
Jesus who came to Bethlehem, ancient of days, though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one. so grateful, Lord. Meet our hearts today by the power of your Spirit and humble us before you as we worship you, as we understand the true meaning of Advent, that you sent your only Son to die for our sins, to die for us in our sin, because you loved us so much. Again, prompt us with the depth of that understanding, we pray this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue singing Christmas carols, O come, O ye faithful, and a little town of Bethlehem. Yeah. 
the Tuttle family to come up for the lighting of the Advent candle. And maybe a gallow too. Okay. On this second day, su Sunday in Advent, we light the Bethlehem candle remembering Jesus' place of birth. Seven hundred years ago, before the birth of Christ, the prophet Micah declared, but you, O Bethlehem of, of Pratha, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will, who will be ruler over Israel, whose organ, or, or, origins are from, are from from of old, of from ancient times. Then Luke tells us, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that census should be taken off of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the own town of Matt Nazareth to, in Galilee to Judah, Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line, in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pl pleased to pledge to be married to him and was accepting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, keep us awake and alert, watching for your kingdom. Make us strong in faith so we may greet your son when he comes and joyfully praise him with you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thomas. Please stand for O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Rejoice, church. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to me, O Israel. O come, thou wisdom. As we begin our Advent season, it's just, man, it comes quick, doesn't it? But it's so good to be able to come and just to worship the Lord and to sing these carols so early in the season, just to lift up our voices to the Lord and, and uh, hear from Him this morning as we open His Word together. This morning we continue in our study in the book of James, and it's been a climb up the mountain, and for some of us, it's been a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, for some of us, it's been a little bit challenging to really recognize the fact that James wants us to have the marks of authentic faith, that his goal for us, as it was his goal for the people that he's writing these, this letter to, this epistle to, is that they might be mature in Christ, that as people look at them and as people look at us, they might see Christ in us. They might see the marks of authentic faith. One of the questions that the world is asking today is, What's really authentic? What's really true? What really has substance? Or is it all just a facade? Is it all just a, a, an act? Is it all just a, a language that we use, but inside it doesn't really make much difference? And James is really helping me and helping us out to how to figure that out. How to really get our lives in such a place where we are living what God would have us do to be living in His, in his will. We've looked at the passages that have talked to us about our speech, how we talk to one another, and this morning is no different. James has a burden on his heart. And if you haven't noticed through the passages that we've looked at before, he has a burden on his heart that what we say really makes a difference. How we say things to one another reveals who we are in our, our very existence in our heart. How we treat one another, whether we say that we're Christians and then we don't do anything about it, is our faith just a lot of words or do we put action behind our faith so that people know that being a Christian is a real thing, that living for Jesus is a real lifestyle and not just a religion, so to speak, that helps us in our daily life just getting us through the day, but no, it's actually a way of life. Uh, this morning we want to continue in that vein recognizing the fact that we have a wisdom from above that James is wanting us to, and has wanted us to encounter. That wisdom from above is a wisdom that brings peace and peaceful relationships between God and man and between man and each other. It's not a, a wisdom that comes from the earth that brings division and chaos, but it is a wisdom that brings the peace of God. And as we continue to celebrate the Advent season, we realize that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he desires for us to understand that peace and to live it out. Uh, last week we saw how James uh, kind of encountered us by saying that what are the things that make us fight? What are the things that make us argue? What are the things that cause us to have division amongst ourselves? And he reminded us that it's actually with what's going on inside ourselves. The desires that we have, that battle against ourselves. And we project those battles onto someone else. And we allow our, um, our battles within us to cause us to have an adulterous relationship with the Lord. 
because we realize the fact that we live in a world that is at war within the Spirit of God, and many times we try to ride the fence and have one foot in the world and have one foot in God's kingdom. And James is here to help us guide ourselves up the path of maturity up to the peak and guide us in that sense of what is the pathway to maturity? How do we deal with one another and how do we deal with God? Who is actually really in control? And this morning, we pick up James's uh, reminders to us and we would think that after last week, he hit us pretty hard that he might be done. I have, I have some news for us. He's kind of just getting started. And uh, so we pick up our ears, we open up our hearts, we allow the Spirit of God to, to search us and to acknowledge what's going on inside our lives this morning. And as we look at uh, chapter 4, verse 11, if you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open up the, there. If not, the words will be on the screen. And hear the word of the Lord. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if, the Lord, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, and such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we open these challenging words to us this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide our thoughts. We ask, Lord, that our hearts would be open and available to you. You're teaching us this morning through the power of your word. We thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Adopting a kingdom perspective. As we mentioned last week, we live in two different kingdoms. The kingdom of the world and the kingdom of the heaven, of God's kingdom. You remember Jesus when Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus said, but my kingdom is not of this world. And the question that we will answer this morning, or we will discuss this morning anyway, is which kingdom do you live in? Which kingdom do I live in? Which kingdom is the very core, the central part of who we are as human beings, as God's children, is the, is the issue at hand. There's two things that I want to mention, two things we want to talk about. The first one is in verses 11 and 12. And the inference is this. There is only one judge and one lawgiver and you're not it. The second one comes from verses 13 and 17. There is only one who is sovereign, and you're not him. Neither am I. Having put that in perspective, having that let, let us sink in for a minute, James reminds us how we talk to one another. He says this, brothers, do not slander one another. He's very direct. Do not slander. When you slander somebody, you demean them. You say irresponsible things to them or about them. You say things that aren't true. You gossip behind their backs. You judge them in a way that only God should be able to judge a human being. You judge their very heart. You judge their very intentions. And James has said, don't slander. Why do you slander one another? We shouldn't do that. Anyone who speaks evil against his brother judges him, stands in a place of judgment. Now think about the relationships that you have with your family and your friends. Think of the relationships that you have within your church. And how often do we cut each other apart by our words? Last week we don't get our way, so we fight 
and argue. Today, uh, James reminds us that that continues in the way we continue on in that relationship. We haven't turned our back on the world and we haven't gone towards God. In fact, James is reminding them that you are continuing in that path of worldly living. And the, the, the inference of that and the, and the responsibility that shows up in the sense that you continue to slander one another. That happens so much in the church. People don't get what they want and they slander one another. I think James feels a little bit like what Paul felt like in 1 Corinthians as Paul is addressing the 1 Corinthian church. He says this, brothers, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, brothers I could not address you as spiritually, as spiritual but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk and not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are worldly, for there is jealousy and quarreling among you. Now in the Corinth church, they were bickering and fighting about who they would follow. Some would follow one teacher and another one would follow another teacher. And they're saying, I'm of Apollos and I'm of Paul and my way is better than your way. And they would fight over that. But we in the church have a different have a way of fighting over all kinds of things and quarreling about all kinds of stuff. And James is reminding us is that when we do that, we are infant, we are acting like baby Christians. We are getting what we need is what we need is solid food, but we can only take on the milk of the word. You see, James accuses us of being judgmental. The sign of a spiritually immature person is a judgmental Christian. Someone who sees it as their way or the highway. Someone who sees it that, by golly, I'm going to get it my way or I'm not going to get it at all. James accuses us of putting that kind of language in the way that we treat one another by slandering one another. The Bible is clear about if you have a problem with somebody, you go to them directly. You don't go to somebody else. You don't come to the pastor and complain about somebody else. You go to that person and say, I have an issue with you, can we talk? We have a tendency, what we call triangulization. Triangulization means that I have a problem with this person, but I'm going to get this person in my camp so that I can gang up on that person. And we have a tendency to have little corners of people with influence, that we're going to go to people of like-minded with that influence, and we're going to address this issue that way. So our collective um, authority or our collective power would have an influence on that particular issue, whether it be in the church or whether it be outside the church. And James is reminding us that the way that we talk to one another, and more importantly, the way that we talk about one another, is what's at hand. And he's calling them spiritually infant, spiritually infantile. And I wonder if we need to hear that same warning as we walk the path, walk the, the trail up the mountain pass to maturity. How, cult, how different it is in 1 John 3.16 when John says this, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for each other. It's interesting that that's John 3, 1 John 3.16. It's a great way to memorize that verse. John 3.16, we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And John picks up on that and says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and so we ought to lay down our lives for each other. You see, in verse 12, there is only one lawgiver. We don't have the privilege or the authority to be the judge. We are to be witnesses. We are to be ambassadors. We are to encourage and build up the body of Christ so that the headship of Christ would be the one that we look to for wisdom, for guidance, for direction. That is a kingdom perspective. That as we look to Christ, who is the head of the church, and we seek his wisdom and his guidance, and his spirit within us, we are living a kingdom lifestyle. We have drawn near to God and we have resisted the evil one as we talked about last week. 
And as we draw near to God as a congregation, as we draw near to God as individuals, the Bible says in James that he draws near to us. And what a glorious thing that is that the God of the universe would want to draw near to you or would want to draw near to me, a sinner, someone who walks a path that is not straight all the time, someone who walks a path that needs to have his path be forgiven as we confess our sins to him. So the question is, if the God is the only judge, is, is there, uh, are there ever opportunities that we should judge, ever? Romans 2, verse 1, let me just read that to you. After chapter 1, we like to quote Romans chapter 1 that talks about the de degradation of humanity and how we have fallen short and God's judgment is upon um, the, human, the human condition as it's sinful. He reminds those of us who are following Christ in chapter 2. You, meaning us as the church, therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You see, we have no business being in the position of being judged, people judging them in the sense that they, as a human being, are worthless, have no value, have no position, have no inference of, of, of being a person in God's eyes. And yet, are there times that we should judge? I think of 1 Corinthians, where Paul encounters the, Christian, the Corinthian church there, and he says this, you see this is a good thing, that there's a man living with his mother, his, his father's wife, whether that's his, his fleshly mother, his biological mother, or it's an adopted mother. But as, in essence, there's a young man who's having sexual relationships with his father's mother, or his father's wife. And Paul says to them, you guys are proud of that because you're so inclusive and you just accept everybody who they are. And we're proud of the fact that we're being that inclusive. And he says, that ought not to be that way. Get rid of the guy. Get him out of the church. Show some discipline. Now that kind of judgment is a different kind of judgment than the judgment that I think James is talking to us about. Because that judgment is a judgment of discipline, not a judgment of condemnation. The judgment of discipline is different because when we discipline in the church, or when the church disciplines, it should be the goal of restoration, not condemnation. See, there's three things that the church should be involved in that we are called to do. We are called to proclaim the gospel. We are called to do the elements. We are called to baptize and, and proclaim the element through the, through the table of the Lord. And we are also called to, to show um, biblically directed church discipline. And that's what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians. Are we to judge other things? Well, yeah, we are to judge other things. We are called to judge the spirits. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says... Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets are out in the world today. And yes, we do need to judge the teachings of people who claim to be Christian. Are their teaching in line with the Word of God, or are they coming up with their own theology based on other things? We have a lot of that going on, and we've talked about that in previous sermons, about how there are so many false teachers out there trying to win people's attention and, and, uh, and their, their, their lives to follow them. Warren Wiersbe says this about this kind of judgment in James. James is not forbidding us to, be discriminate, to use discrimination or to even evaluate people. Christians need to have discernment, but they must not act like God in passing judgment. We must first examine our own lives and then try to help others. You see, God is the judge. 
God is the one who can save. God is the one who can destroy. Matthew, 20, Matthew 10, 28 says this, We are not to be afraid of those who have, have no power to judge and kill, who have power to judge and kill the body, but we fear the one who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. You see, a worldly kingdom perspective looks at humanity as the final say, looks at our human nature as our final word. And the question I have for you and for me is, who gets the final say in your life? Who determines what happens in your world? Are you the center of your universe? Or is there something else that's the center of your universe? And James addresses that now. In verse 13 he says, now listen. And I like how he says, now listen, because he wants to get your attention. He's like, check this out. This is important. Perk up your ears and listen to hear what I have to say. He says this, today or tomorrow, um, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city and spend that year there and carry on business and make money. What's wrong with that? That just sounds like a good business plan to me. I mean, if you're a business person, right, you have a business plan. You know, most businesses say, well, this is your goal. These are the way, the way you achieve your goal. Why is James harping on this business plan? Well, the reason why he's harping on this business plan is because these people were neglecting something very important. And before he gets there, he says this, why do you even, why? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring. So why are you spending so much time and planning and preparation when you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? And then he says this, what is your life? That's a great question. What is your life in the grand scheme of things? How important are you in the grand scheme of things? Of all of world's history, of all the universes that are created that by God, you look at your life and I look at my life and we're just a, a wisp. And that's what James says. He says, what is your life? And here's what your life is. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's what happens with the world's perspective. You are here for just a little while, and then it's over. That speaks to the urgency of the gospel. You have family and friends that yet know, do not know Christ. People say, well, I can put off turning to Christ till I get older. Let me sow my oats as a teenager or a young person. And then, when I get serious, then I'll consider following Christ. Or let me get through this one business deal. Let me make this amount of money. Let me get my nest egg together. And then I'll consider following Jesus. But for now, I am the kingdom. I am my master. I am the ruler of my own self. I am the ruler of my life. But our kingdom attitude is completely opposite of that. Psalm 48 says this, I delight to do your will, O God. 1 John 2.17 says this, The world and its desires will pass away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. You see, what it means to live in the kingdom is a desire, a sure heartfelt desire to do the will of God. We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that truly your prayer? Is that truly my prayer? That when I wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, you say to, to the Lord, your will be done and not mine. You are, the, you are the center of my universe. You are the ones who is important to me more than myself. He challenges those with that business Proposition, he says, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, you're going to go to this city and that city and make money. But you have no regard for me. You have no regard for the Lord to lead you or to guide you. It's all about you. It's all about you being the center of your universe. 
There's a great poem that speaks to this, and you probably have heard it. It's a poem by William Henley called Invictus, and this is the worldly perspective. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, for I am the master of my fate, and I am the captain of my soul. Does that ring true to you? Is that your worldly outlook? You are the master of your fate. You are the captain of your soul. That perspective is a short-sighted perspective. The perspective that, that James wants these businessmen to understand is that when you do that and you neglect to put God in the center of your business practices, you are short-sighted. You are myopic in the way that you are doing your business. And he gives the answer in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, it is, is it, it is the Lord's will. If it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. That's a good practice to get into. Lord, if it is your will, show me the way. Lord, yes, you have called us to make plans. You have called us to be responsible with our, our, our finances. You have called us to be responsible with our futures. And yet, Lord, you are the center of that, and we want your will to be done. You see, so much time, so much energy is placed in us being successful in the world's eyes. We work so hard for our retirement to get that nest egg so that we can relax, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. It reminds me of a song. <laughs> It always reminds me of a song by uh, uh, the grassroots. Sha la la la, live for today, live for today. And don't worry about tomorrow. Live for today. But in some respect, there is some little bit of truth to that. Because didn't Jesus say, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself as well? In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, your heavenly Father will take care of the needs when you put your life in his hands. The difference between the grassroots and the difference between them and Jesus is the grassroots lived an Epicurean lifestyle. They were out for their sheer pleasure. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I'm just going to live today and live it up. And Jesus says, you don't have to worry about tomorrow because I've got it in control. And you can place your trust in your, in your life in my hands because I will provide for all your needs. Instead, we ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, that is a kingdom perspective. Jesus becomes the very center of who we are. Psalm 37, verses 3 through 5, reminds us that to trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Confirm your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do it. Now, many of us have used this passage for our own selfish purposes. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. He's not saying that if you delight yourself that you'll get whatever you want. He says that when you delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord delights in your, in your heart, and He will give you the delight itself. It reminds me of David, King David, who had a man after God's own heart. And yet David's lifestyle, we remember, was full of sin. And yet David's desire was to be all in for God. There's a way of saying it, that King Saul had no heart for God. Solomon had a half heart for God, and that's why the, why the kingdom split. But David had a whole heart for God, and that's why he was called 
a man after God's own heart. But instead, these business people would keep on boasting. Verse 16, instead of saying, if it is the Lord's will, they say, it's all about my kingdom. I'm reminded of King Nebuchadnezzar, who looks over his great, vast expanse of his kingdom, and he says, look what I've done. Look what my hands have provided. And God smit him and put him in a pasture to eat grass for a while until he was able to repent. You see, when we put ourselves in God's place, God is a jealous God, and he will put us in our place whether it be in this world, in this lifetime, or come judgment day. The day will come that God's will will be done in everybody's life in the sense that His will will be accomplished. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Adopting a kingdom perspective reminds us of the fact that we as a church, as a body of believers, have oftentimes ex accepted ways of the world into our ways of doing things as a church, whether they be worldly business models, whether they be um, issues that come out and influences that come out of the new age. So much time and so many things come into our, our, our being or into our sphere of influence that we must be careful. We must judge the spirits. We don't judge people's eternities. We don't judge their hearts, but we do judge their actions. We do judge what's going on as, a, as it regards to the Word of God. It's not my judgment, not my own personal feeling, but it's what God's Word has to say. That's why Paul, when he talked about the first Corinthian guy, he was in sexual sin. And so we as a, as a culture today still need to de deal with the sexual sin issue, recognizing the fact that there is only one sexual orientation towards our sexuality. We are man and woman. And a marriage is a, is a marriage between one man and one woman. That's God's, that's God's definition of marriage. And if we don't agree with that definition of marriage, we're not agreeing with God's definition of marriage, but we are in fact inventing our own. And so what happened in, in Paul's situation in 1 Corinthians, in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul admonishes the church to bring the guy back because he had confessed, he had repented. And now it was time to restore. And we as a church, while we call out the sins of the world, when people repent, we need to bring them back. We need to welcome them back as they repent and come back into the life and witness of the church. That's adopting kingdom perspective. Because God is a God of love, God is a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy and grace. And we as the Church of Christ, the followers of Jesus, need to show that mercy and grace as we stay true to the witness of the gospel. Adopting a kingdom perspective means that we submit to God and draw near to Him. We delight to do His will. It is our joy to be able to do the will of God. It is our heart's desire to be able to put Him in the center of our lives, to live holy according to His word. For we know the good thing to do often, and yet sometimes we don't do it. Verse 17. When we know the good thing to do and don't do it, that is sin. You see, sin is not just an, an active thing. Sometimes it's a sin of omission, that we neglect to do the things that we're supposed to do. We neglect to do the good. That's why James reminded them back in uh, chapter 2, you say that you have faith but have no works. How can that faith save you? When you know the good thing to do, when they say to a, a, a fellow brother or sister that, oh, I see that you're hungry and cold. Well, just go be warm and be fed and you'll be all right instead of providing for their need. We as brothers and sisters in Christ look out for one another and care for one another and take care of each other because that's what Christ has done for us. In closing, I want to read another poem. And it is a response to the Invictus poem. It's written by a lady named Dorothea Day. And instead of Invictus, it's called My Captain. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be, for Christ is the conqueror of my soul. Since his the sway of circumstance, 
I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him and his the aid, that in spite of menace of the years keeps me and keeps and shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate, and Christ is the captain of my soul. Does that ring true to you today? Maybe today is the day that you need to turn your life over to, God, over to the Lord. Maybe today is the day that God is asking you and calling you to repent and to come into salvation. To know that He is the captain of the universe, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, and the one who came and died on a cross so that you might have your, your sins forgiven so that you might know that you have eternal life, that the kingdom perspective is an eternal kingdom. The kingdom of God is here, but it's not all here. We live in the already, but the not yet, and we look forward to the, all, or to the not yet, knowing that when Christ comes again, we will be restored forever and ever. What a day that will be. A kingdom perspective looks forward to that day, and as we look forward to the day, we give out God's love and grace to the world around us. It is my prayer that you know Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I must warn you, you are in deep danger. You are in danger of eternal punishment away from the holy and righteous God. You see, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You have no ability to reach up to a holy God and earn your own salvation. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, call out to Him and He will save you. Cry out to Him for His mercy and He will rescue you. And He will be your captain forever and ever. And He will guide you along the paths of righteousness and you will be set free from the sin that so entangles us. If you know Christ today, Celebrate the goodness of God's mercy and grace. And maybe there's some here today that need to get re reacquainted with that love and grace that God has. Maybe you've been here just going to church, just kind of going through the motions, but yet you've been living in the worldly kingdom and not in the kingdom of the Lord. So today make it your decision to come to Christ and live in that kingdom perspective and allow Christ to be Lord of your lives, knowing that he already is. That's why we celebrate this table. And that's why we're coming to this table even now. Because this is the kingdom meal. This is the meal that represents who we are in Christ. It is the meal that represents who Christ is and what he has done for us for all of eternity. And as we as brothers and sisters share this meal together, we celebrate the goodness of our God until he comes again. So with that, I would like to ask those that are coming to help serve the communion to come at this time and let us worship the Lord in the serving of his meal. Lord, we love you so much. It's our heart's desire to be kingdom people, to live our lives with you as the center of our lives. We thank you for this meal that reminds us that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as we begin to celebrate Advent, this month, Lord, continue to remind us that you are that king, but you are also the prince of peace. And we do pray for peace in our world. We do pray that you would use us to be peacemakers because we know the one who is the, the prince of peace. So, Lord, open up our hearts as we serve you. Guide us into your word by the power of your spirit. Anoint us so that we might share the love of Christ to the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's continue with our heads bowed. A few prayer requests from the church. Well, Heavenly Father, we do pray for Patrick Hoover, for his heart, for healing for his heart after this massive heart attack, Lord. We pray that you would heal the damage done, be with the doctors, give them wisdom, be with Patrick, hold him fast, strengthen him and his heart. Of course, Lord, be with Paulette, who's there by his side and worried 
Give her a peace that passes understanding and your comfort, Lord Jesus. And then we do, of course, lift up Patty Rogers. On the loss of her son, Tim, the age of 62, or Patty has wonderful friends to come around her, but she also requires your touch and her grief. Continue to put that smile on her face, Lord, that she always has, but through the understanding that you give her, that you love her so much. And also be with Patty's daughters, Sheila and Debbie, during this time. We thank you, Lord, so much for the life of Tim and his joy and his strength during his life, his activity, and his blessing to others, his friends. Lord, we do thank you for this time that you have ordained, and we continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you are new with us this morning, or if you're just visiting, we'd love to hear from you. There's a card in the pew rack in front of you, if you would fill that out and put it in the offering plate as we're about to take our offering. Also, there's a prayer card in the pew rack as well. If you have prayer requests that you would like us to be praying for, we do have an amazing prayer team that prays every week for us, and we have people even now praying as we are having our, our worship time together. So don't hesitate to put those prayers on in there if you have something to be prayed for. And we would love to be able to minister to you in that way. As now, let's continue to worship the Lord in the giving of our tithes and our offerings as we give back to him what he has already blessed us with. Amen. seated but let's sing this when I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me firm when the tempter will remain he will hold me firm I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my life is often cold. He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in His own sight, He will hold me fast. Will I let my soul be lost? His promises shall
Amen. And now you may stand for angels from the realms of glory.20 through 21 says this now may the God of peace who through the blood of eternal covenant brought back from our dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom all glory forever and ever amen <laughs> 